Ladies and gentlemen, on this episode of Fighters, Coaches, and Fathers, I'm pleased to have Sam, Saturday Night Fights legend, actually, Sam King with us, who fought, I think, on almost every single card that we had in the beginning years. Sam, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Jeff? Great. Uh, excellent. And thank you for taking the time. I know we had to jump through hoops to get together um, <laughs> this time. But um, before we get talking about your journey into martial arts, um, I saw a post the other day from a, a Saturday Night's fighter, an MMA fighter, Brad Collins. And uh, he posted about how he had just purchased his own house and uh, and how he remembers a time where he was at wrestling practice and he wanted wrestling to continue and continue and to continue because he knew at the end of that wrestling practice, he, he didn't have a home to go to. And uh, I was looking at that and then it really it dawned on me and it dawned on you too that he was talking about the day that you sort of took him in and sort of adopted him as a brother. Do you want to talk about that moment? Yeah, for sure. You know, um, I've known Brad for a long time, probably around 20 years. I think I met him when I was about five years old. And uh, I think we were about 13 years old and uh, he was in grade nine. <laughs> and yeah, the, there was a situation in his life that led to him, led him to a point where, you know, his, his mom moved away and his, his dad wasn't, wasn't there for him at the time. Right. So, um, I ended up, I, I was at home one day and I got a phone call and, uh, it was Brad and he kind of, he kind of just laid out the situation for me and I, I went and took a second, thought about it, ran to the living room, and I was like, hey, mom, is it all right if uh, Brad spends the night for a while? And, <laughs> you know, that was that was the start of something that's still still ongoing to this day, right? So um, I'm, I'm thankful for what I did that day, and I'm, I'm sure he is too. But, you know, uh, from, from a uh, friendship that started 20 years ago now, now we've grown into brothers right and that's that bond i, I definitely um i I've, i haven't had that type of bond with anyone else in my life right yeah so. yeah it, it was cool to see him call you out uh, like that and to talk about how grateful and appreciative he is and, and how he can't believe you know sort of that his life's on a good path now compared to where it could have gone and uh, oh, i love sure. that yeah um having said that let's talk a little bit about baby Sam King, little Sam King and his family growing up in Regina, Saskatchewan. And, uh, you know, your early years and your, your movement into athletics. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I started playing hockey just like any prairie kid at a young age, right? Um, I think, you know, five, six years old, I started playing hockey. And uh, so I was always involved with some sort of athletics my whole life. And... Um, once I got, once I grew up a little bit, um, got into high school, started wrestling and playing football. And I basically, I just tried to, you know, keep that ball rolling because I found as long as I was doing sports, I was keeping myself out of trouble. Right. And that was one thing, you know, growing up, I never really didn't listen too well. I like, I like learning from my own mistakes. So that's one thing that I really found, like if I had idle time, I was, I was very mischievous and tried getting into things or so if, if I filled my time with something positive, then I, I, I could deter myself from, from the negative situations growing up as a teenager. Right. Yeah. What's the quote? Idle hands are the devil's playground. I think I used oh, to yeah. hear it. <laughs> for sure. And there, there's so much temptation growing up, you know, and, and you're so experimental. So, I find filling your filling your idle time with positive positive influences and positive activities uh, really helps, right? Yeah. So you started with hockey. How did you move into more MMA or or uh, wrestling? Uh, I was in uh, I was in grade ten and um, started playing football. And a uh, buddy on the football team, he actually just mentioned, "Yeah, you should come out to the foot or come out to the wrestling team." So. Um, football season ended and wrestling season started and so I was still hanging out with them so I stepped on the mat with them and uh, yeah that was 11 years ago right and 
you know, I'm, I'm thankful, thankful for that because if it wasn't for that, I would, I would never got into mixed martial arts after high school. So you went to the high uh, football guy, you, you, you said football season's done, focus on wrestling, you start wrestling. Um, what's the beginning, the, like the start of that wrestling? How's that feel like? And when does your first competition happen? And, and Man, actually, um, the story about that. So I was in grade 10 and um, I showed a little bit of promise. So my wrestling coach, uh, Ron Gonzalez, he um, had a wrestle off because back then we had a big team. We had man, 40 some kids on our team. Right. And so we had a wrestle off to see who was going to who was going to start at my weight category. And it was me against a grade 12. And I ended up beating that grade 12 who started previous years before me in that same weight class. I beat him for the starting spot. And then a week later, uh, my first wrestling match, I ended up in the newspaper because I was doing an Olympic lift to the guy. And that, that was a picture that ended up in the newspaper. So uh, right away, I, I found a little bit of a little bit of fame just on the wrestling mat, and then that from that first match and that first you know um, wrestle off, I carried that momentum, and I won city championships my first year of wrestling. So um, it really it really brought me to new heights because I played hockey for 13 years, and I only ever won one championship. So the first year of wrestling, I won a championship. So something kind of clicked. It was like, man, you know, I'm pretty, like kind of good at this. So that's where, you know, I kept the ball rolling. And my first year of wrestling, I fell in love with it. Because um, I, th I think the, the reason why I fell in love with it, with it was when it came down to it, it was you and another person. And you chose the destiny. You chose how that match was going to end. And when you're playing a team sport, football, hockey, really any team sport, um, if there's one guy who's really dragging you down, that can influence the play of the rest of the team. So I find that... Or one penalty can lose the game, right? So, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And in wrestling or, or jujitsu, anything like that, it's all the weights on your shoulders. Even though you depend on your team to prepare you for that situation, um, it's up to you to go out there and perform right and that's one thing that i fell in love with right away talk to me about the legend himself outside of you uh chi chi uh, ron gonzalez man i remember uh the first days uh when i was doing jujitsu and he would come and he would do an arm drag on me and throw me into a wall just by a quick shot of the call how strong the guy's just and he's such a nice great guy talk to me a little bit about your relationship with, with ron Man, um, if I if it wasn't for Chi Chi, I wouldn't have graduated high school. That's like, I him and I had a very strong relationship. It started out, uh, you know, he was he was um, my wrestling coach turned into a guidance guidance counselor and mentor in high school, and um, it actually grew before I even graduated high school. Grew into a friendship. So that's um, that's something where you don't see a lot of a lot of teachers and students grow that relationship still inside the school right so um man that guy even after even after high school he told me he was like man i put my neck on the line for you a couple times so um I, i'll forever be grateful for that and the guy just he carries around and he carries himself so high and brings so much energy to the table it's it's hard it's hard not to be positive and in a good mood around him right yeah, Chi Chi's an interesting character, and I could never put, you can't put your finger on it and say, this is why, but the guy is just classy, and he works hard, and he's always smiling and positive, and, and I think we've always, every time you meet him, you're just like, hey, I really like this guy, he seems to be doing good things. So you win city championship, then uh, in your first year, you fall in love with the sport of wrestling, and uh, it is an amazing moment when you see or you feel something just feels like it fulfills you in not only physically but in almost uh an emotional way we are like oh this might be a thing that i can go forward with what happens after that um yeah it, it definitely felt you know like it was it was the the missing piece to the puzzle in my life at that point and at that time um after that grade 11 came around i uh i wrestled really well throughout the year city championships came and uh, my first match, the draw didn't go so well, and 
the first match of the tournament should have been the city final. So me and the guy, um, his name was Bevin Sinclair. We wrestled. He ended up uh, double-legging me off the mat, and I got injured. So um, that that's that was the story of my grade 11 year. I ended up, I didn't make it to provincials. I got injured. So then the next year, uh, my grade 12 year, I came back, and um, I won all but one tournament in the high school season, won cities, high school provincials, club provincials, went to nationals, and uh, made it to the gold medal semifinal at nationals ended up placing um sixth overall in canada and um that that was you know one of the big accomplishments for me especially uh the 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 weight that i wrestled at was a 79 kilo weight class and i only weighed 70.5 so making it that far in the tournament was really an accomplishment for me yeah that sounds awesome and uh looking back on that it must have been a heck of a year um what was the injury that you had uh that happened in grade 11. um see, bevan ended up uh double legging me and i landed on the on the hardwood floor with my arm above uh, arm above my head so it kind of hurt my rotator cuff a little bit just just something that i couldn't continue that day and maybe i i believe i was out for a month maybe two and then it kind of got back to normal just worked it out a little bit of rehab and it was good to go if the reason i asked that question is because i love a good comeback story when it comes from injury in grade 11 uh, at the end of the football year i blew out my left knee my right knee and uh and then i immediately went into surgery got it done rehabbed it and was defensive player of the year um on the team the next year after and that's not easy stuff to do and a lot of people once they have injuries even when they're young they don't come back and it sounds like you came back ferociously and uh and did well so you continue to to do well but you can't be in high school forever what happens next no you know those glory those glory days don't live forever right so after high school i took about a year off where i didn't do too much you know um played a lot of video games um, ate a lot of food, got out of shape. And I remember I, I went to the Lawson Aquatic Center here in the city. And um, when I left high school, uh, Chi Chi, he tested my body fat. And I was, I was, I had a, like, I was under 10% body fat. I was very, I was very in shape. I was, you know, aesthetically, I looked good too. So um, about a year after high school, I couldn't even do a pull up. I, uh, I I was that out of shape. I sat there. I didn't do anything for a year. And um, yeah, I went to the Lawson Aquatic Center with uh, Brad and a couple other friends. And I tried doing a pull up and that's when it clicked. It was like, man, I can't even lift myself up. I, dude, how, how did I get like this? So that, that, was, that was the turning point in kind of my life where I was like, I need to do something. So there... I went down to complete MMA um, and it's been just under nine years now. So that's, I, I took that rest, that love for wrestling and I turned it into the love for jujitsu. And I remember my first day, my first jujitsu class. And I still tell this story to the day because I coach a lot of white belts. Um, I remember my first jujitsu warm up. I, I wanted to quit. I was tired. I was out of shape. We were doing elbow escapes and I just, I had nothing in me. I wanted to quit so bad. I made it through the warm up. I made it through my first practice. And then I just, you know, okay, next one, next one, next one. Nine years later, I'm here, right? So there, there was definitely uh, some self-talk and some, some uh, I, had to, I had to build myself up big time after that year off because I knew what I was capable of and I dug myself a pretty big hole that I had to get out of. Um, took about two years. I got my blue belt. I was back in shape and that's when I started fighting. And you go on a tear with, with <laughs> an amateur tear where you are crushing dudes. Win one, win two, win three. If we look at some of the guys that you're fighting there, and uh, it just goes Chris Berry, Adam Zarillo, Scott Gunn, Ian Olin, Elijah Richards, Andy Jack, all tough fights. But it start people start like at about your third or fourth win, nobody's wanting to fight you now. Like they're just like, oh, I saw your video on YouTube and uh, I'm, I'm not 100%. I'm not fighting Sam King. How did that, how did, how did that, like, how did that feel? Uh, it was tough, you know. Um, near the end of my near the end of my uh, amateur career, 
I actually got uh, I got a national ranking. So that was that was something that turned heads, right? And uh, uh, I wasn't even the one who stumbled upon it. It got sent to me one day, and it was it was a uh, fellow training partner and fighter, Paul Grabinski, who actually he just sent me a message, and it was it was a screenshot of my national posting and. In the 145 weight class, I was ranked sixth in all of Canada. So that was, you know, from a guy from Regina, Saskatchewan, who, you know, a couple, couple years back couldn't do a pull-up. That was something that, you know, pat myself on the back for. But hold it, holding that ranking or, you know, people talking about you, definitely um, pe people don't want to fight you, right? Because they, they don't know if the hype's real. So, yeah, that second year... Um, fighting as an amateur it was hard for hard to find fights and um the the fighters were you know even tougher which i have no problem with but uh after that amateur career it really that that ranking kind of kind of hurt because we would have to we'd have to travel the amateur the amateur commission in saskatchewan got shut down so we had we had no commission whatsoever no fights for two years in saskatchewan so um not having a, not having posted a lot of footage online and when you know people google your name the rankings come up western canada canadian rankings um canadian rankings they uh they kind of shy away from that especially when you know you go to alberta and you can get two fighters in alberta um from different gyms fighting on the same card kind of makes a rivalry so for two years there after i went on that terror it was it was hard for us to find fights for that reason, right? And AJ, he's he even told me that you know he was he was forfeiting my purse just to try and find a fight, and you know there there were still fighters backing down, and um, it was it was just tough for two years until until we got the the professional commission in Saskatchewan here, and then yeah. even after, yeah, but, go ahead, right? But yeah, I get that. So then the only guys that are going to fight you are either fighters that are almost like are way better than the records say or they're guys that are absolutely insane and so you had fight tom connor is uh, one of your losses as a pro he's now the xffc champ uh and is is going to defend uh in in december i think john henderson i think i'm not sure what happened it was an injury if we just got scared um and then ryan pang and so now you and then injuries start to sort of come up uh in the pro career yeah. What, uh, how does, how does that all affect? Um, the first fight, you know, uh, congrats to Tom O'Connor for winning that, for winning that belt. Um, when I do return to MMA, that's one that I definitely want to get back. But, uh, for now, congrats, man. Um, but the injuries, um, I, I suffered an injury in my left knee just before my, just before my second fight, um, against Ryan Pang and, um i'm still i'm still going through it and this is it's been it's been two years now and uh the cut the road to recovery has been quite long but yeah it definitely it's it sucked because i was i was looking forward to to getting back in my winning ways and you know even though ryan pang was a tough fighter man he, he proved it the guy fought and fought a three-round war with me the guy uh you know came out on top and that's also also one that i'd like to get back when it, when i return to it um, yeah, and one of the things that AJ does, even though he's your coach and he wants to guide you to, is he doesn't give his fighters uh, steal like bad easy fights. He no, never has, no. and it's and it's, I get that uh, because, but he always makes you guys better. But even when you look at Adam Wayne um, and some of his fights that he had in the MFC one, like you're just like, wow, that that guy was amazing. The guy that he was fighting, and 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 so AJ has this sort of thing to go. You know what? we're going to put on a great event. I got faith that it's very possible that Sam can win this fight, very possible that I can win this fight, but it ain't going to be easy. And he puts you in wars for sure. Yeah, for sure. It's a, and, and he knows that it's a very real possibility that we can win, but it's also a very real possibility we can lose. Um, and going back to uh, Adam's first fight in MFC, uh, one thing that a lot of people don't know is I believe he took that fight on another two or three weeks notice. He took it short, short notice and barely lost. Like um, you know, Adam Adam's done a lot with his career here in here in Regina, and then now that he's moved to Montreal, I'm like looking to see big things from that kid. Um, 
but yeah, as for everyone else in the gym, uh, AJ's never given us easy fights. That's not something we believe in. And um, that's, that's the way I want it. Because if, you know, he handed me a bunch of easy fights, then, you know, I have a stacked record, but I haven't been challenged. Yeah, you weren't going to get it. No one, no one was going to fight you. That was easy anyway, because they look at your record, your amateur record. See the videos, your knockouts, and you're like, uh, "No, I'm not fighting that guy." So you really, that's going to happen. I mean, and with Adam's situation with Alex Martinez, that guy was an alternate on the Ultimate Fighter show. So we didn't, I didn't know that till after. I was like, "Oh, really? Is he doing that?" So AJ probably guides your mentality to say you got to do this a certain way. But at the end of it, he's like, "Yeah, the guy you just lost to is actually going was an alternate on the show or that type of thing." So. <laughs> Yeah, that's, and, and that's something. That's something like AJ does his homework. He knows the guys he puts us up against, and he just doesn't like. He he won't mention anything until after the fact. Be like, yeah, that guy's like ranked third in the world at jujitsu. Like, sorry, I didn't tell you. Just slipped my mind for eight weeks. You know, <laughs> but that, that's something that he kind of does to us. And um, as one as one of his students, I it. it it, it's given me the mentality over the years that it doesn't matter because when I step on that mat, I'm I'm gonna bring it to him. It doesn't matter if he's number one in the world or 200. I I'm bringing my I'm bringing the game, and that that ranking doesn't mean anything to me. I'm gonna continue to push forward and try and try and get that W right. Um, one of the big things with me, especially like jujitsu or MMA, win or lose, you know you're gonna be in a fight. You're gonna be sore after it's. You know, it's not going to be easy. So that's one thing. Even if I know I'm beat, I'm still coming forward and I'm still trying to do as much damage as possible. Well, I remember uh, talking to some of your training partners, and I know you love them. But when you were when you were going up to it, and they're like, "Yeah, I got to spar with Sam tonight," and they're not they're not happy about it because they're like, "You're going to make you better," but you're going pretty much eighty percent on them, and they know they're going to get. And they're just your training partners, but you got to train hard in order to make that fight a little easier, right? For sure, for sure, you do. And that being said, it was it was the same thing with me, you know. I got to go in with Adam Wayne, Jesse Loeffler, Matt Fedler, you know, some of these guys, you know, Brad, even AJ steps in sometimes. Man, when you're cutting down weight, AJ's a big dude. So, um, and the sh like the Shark Tank drills, you go in there, you get one round every every minute, you get a fresh guy that's outweighing you, that's stronger than you and just as good as you. It's man, it it's hard not to get better. Mm -hmm. Hey, when I, I love that. One of the things that you did better than almost any other fighter at the time was create your fan base. And uh, you'd always have about 100 or 250 people that would show up. They'd be at the front row. A lot of them would be family. They'd all be wearing your shirts. And in the, in the, in the, in the, not national, in the regional circuit now, people are looking for fighters to have a responsibility to sell tickets and uh you sort of have done a really good job of that and have been the role model to do that how, how, what would your advice be to other fighters that are trying to develop that knowing that hey man the tickets that you're able to sell um actually help your fight person your training camp and your partners man you definitely you you have to sell yourself um you're you're basically your own product, right? You, you build yourself up in the gym as a machine. Now you have to go and you have to sell yourself just like any other product. You go and you, you want to buy headphones, you know you got to buy Beats by Dre, right? So you have to believe in yourself that you're the best product for these people. So you go out, you sell yourself, and you make them believe that you're the best product for them. They're going to show up and they're going to support you. I remember uh, when I bought the shirt that you're wearing, and it's over there. I should have put it on today. And I'm like, hey, Sam, what are you doing? And you're like, I think you're like 40 bucks. And I'm like, 40 bucks, I'll give you 20. You're like, 40 bucks. And you walk away. <laughs> and I was like, how did this guy just negotiate me out of 40 bucks with this shirt? And of course, I gave it because I loved it. And uh, it's uh, yeah, hell of a negotiator, my friend. Um, yeah, I, that that's exactly what you have to do, right? Don't take no for an answer. Put a smile on their face and make them walk away happy yeah, it's it's already in my in my hand you're not taking it back you're gonna go train i can't even give it anywhere i guess i owe you yeah. Yeah, it was hilarious uh, i like that um so over the last couple of years uh some big changes in your life uh you recently got engaged yes uh, yeah to, to talk to me a little bit about how you met her and um in and, and that story 
Well, man, uh, it was after it was after my last amateur fight. Um, you know, there there was an influx of of social media people adding me on social media and stuff like that, and Tia was one of them. So um, I kind of noticed her through throughout everyone. So you know, I shot her a message, and uh, we ended up hanging out. And that was that was five years ago, and that's that's kind of it was it wasn't a big elaborate story where you know uh, I saw her in passing, we made eye contact, and you know it was love at first sight. The the funny thing about it was I had a big hematoma hematoma over my left eye, and she actually got into a fight um, at the bar. So the the first time we hung out, we both we both just. Uh, just recently got into a fight so we got we kind of joke about that that you know we our heads weren't all there because we just got into, like they were smashed around a little bit and um but uh no we just uh we met on we met on facebook uh five years ago and yeah now we're engaged so that's uh it, it's kind of a funny story but no, no that's, I, I, it's pretty simple uh, i like it um uh, but they also say that uh couples that train together stay together and uh i had a conversation with cleveland or we interviewed cleveland bentley this week and uh sarah morris his wife uh is a ufc fighter and we talked a little bit about how um the uh, relationship sometimes have different level of stresses if you're dieting down or anything um what is it is it different having two people sort of competitive uh, in a relationship and how do you get through the struggles that you that may have to go through? Uh, yeah, it, it does get challenging sometimes, especially when you have to, you have to spend a lot of time in the gym, right? Um, right now, right now I'm kind of going through it because I, I'm preparing to go to Worlds at the end of the year. So a lot of my, a lot of my spare time instead of being, you know, spent at home or um, doing activities with Tia are, spent at work and at the gym. So you, you, you find yourself in a position where you have to balance how, how you spend your time. But, um, it, it helps when she's active and she's also, um, also in the gym with me. So couples who, couples who actually like train together, even though it's not one-on-one -on -one time, you're still, you still get to spend that time together in the gym. Right. And, uh, with us, we like to lift weights together a lot, right? Because um, our skill set's a little bit different for like on the mats in jujitsu. So I can I can help coach her and stuff like that, but it's it's hard for me to actually like go in and get a, get a tough roll in with her, right? Being so much bigger and experienced, but I definitely I definitely like taking her down there and um, showing her showing her a thing or two. But mm -hmm. our our time to get like mo uh, the majority of our time together spent in the gym is lifting weights, and that's that's something where we can push each other and we do push each other consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't matter your skill set, you know, cause each anybody has a certain weight that they're going to do there. It sounds like that's uh, that's working out for you. Yeah, um, yeah. To, Mike Hill and I had a conversation uh, a couple weeks back about routine and morning routine and the difference between fight camp morning routines when you're preparing for a fight uh, versus, you know, your average routine. But understanding from the beginning of our conversation, we talked about how idle hands are the devil's playground. It's important to sort of set your morning up, whether you're in camp or not. Can you share with me your morning routine pre-fight and then your morning routine out with just normally? Okay, yeah. Um, so for a fight camp, normally what you'd like, what I would do is try and get some fast cardio in right away uh wake up fast and cardio and then after that get your get your breakfast in you you know go to work uh throughout work you're eating your eating habits change everything changes when you're in fight camp because you're um more focused on how i can how i can lose weight most efficiently right and stay healthy with the most amount of energy so um you you go through you know you you example with diets and see what works the best for you different nutritionists and stuff like that, but um, yeah your 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 diet's super strict so your life kind of kind of revolves around that and then how what you're eating during the day to what you're doing right before before your training stuff like that um, but yeah so you go to work then you leave. Um, depending what time, 
depending on what time the uh, your class is after, maybe you got time to lift a little bit of weights or you coach the kids class, right? Mm -hmm. um, depends, really depends what it is for uh, the time of year. But if you get, you get a lot of free time you have, you know, you don't have to coach. It's a lot of time in the gym, you know, faster cardio in the morning, work, weights after work, gym time, um, then, you know, wrestling Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu, right? It's, it's really busy. Um, and it's not for everyone. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not, right? Um, but <laughs> li life outside, life outside of fight camp, a little bit more, a little bit more relaxed, right? But you definitely, you definitely want to keep yourself in shape. Maybe order a pizza on the weekends, kick your feet up a little bit more. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot more, a lot more manageable outside. Yeah. Th thanks for that. And it, it, as we're talking here, I just went back to something you said um, to that year after high school, when you said you couldn't do a pull up. And you're sitting there with Brad at the Lawson Aquatic Center. And I was like, and then you said I had to do some self-talk because at first doing, you know, uh, shrimps on, on the, on the jiu-jitsu mat, you wanted to quit right away. Let me ask this question because I'm always fascinated by not just the words that people give self-talk to, but are sometimes them, are they negative and do they push you to do something or are they positive to push you to greatness? And what I mean by that, Sam, is, listen, if you don't do this, you're going to be a piece of garbage. Is that your self-talk yeah. or is it, or is it like, man, listen, this is something you've always loved and driven it to you. This is who you are. And like Jan Stein said, whenever he cut his leg off and is doing all that stuff, like he's sitting there goes, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Like, is it, is there a difference between positive and negative talk? And what's the one that's worked the best in that moment when you're like, I got to change. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like, you know, myself, I'm hard on myself. So a lot of the times it's, let's go get up, get this done, get over it. You know, it's, it's not that hard. Right. Um, other times, you know, if I had a hard day or something like that, it's, it's more of, um, I'm building myself for, for the future, right. More, more questioning rather than in the moment, like you're going to do this right now. This is, you're doing this for what you're going to be in the future. Right. So I definitely, I definitely, um, like flip sides, depending how I'm feeling that day or what I'm doing, right? Because as you're walking up to the bar, you got, you know, 315 on the bar and you're about to go squat it. You got to, you got to do something right now, right? But as you're laying down for bed, you're thinking about that tournament in a month or something, and you have to prepare yourself for that moment in a month, right? Um, so I definitely, I definitely flip flop, but when when i have to talk to myself and i have to do something right now it's i'm a little bit more stern with myself and you know get get it done get over it you'll be better after right yeah and your your mental i love talking to you about the mental side of competition because i remember when we were interviewing you before one of your saturday night fights and uh and you said what's and i asked you what you, your prediction was uh for the fight and you said jeff i've visualized this fight a hundred thousands of times in my mind and I've won it different ways every single time and I thought oh man that was such a beautiful statement so it says it doesn't matter what what happens in the ring I just know my hands getting raised uh, is visualization an important part as we're talking about getting back into competition yeah for sure it is if you know if you can't see yourself do it then how, how are you gonna physically do it if you can't mentally mentally see yourself standing on the podium with your hand raised how are you going to physically go out there and do it um this this goes back even to marketing yourself if you don't believe in yourself how is anybody else going to believe in you right so the first thing is you believing in yourself and um yeah that's visualization for anything is what you have to do and that's big gustavo gustavo talks on it um, on his uh, BJJ mental coach, right? You have to, you have to visualize. You have to see yourself doing something, and you know that's the big thing that I take away from it is if you can't see yourself do it, or if you can't believe in yourself to do it, then why should anybody else? 
And and will you be able to do it? Right? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. 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 Gustavo's amazing, and that's incredible. Oh, so, absolutely. Sam, thank you so much for taking the time. But before we go, just uh, I always curious about uh, growing up and family and and our relationships with the closest members of our families, usually our parents. But um, talk to me about maybe the most valuable lesson that uh, your family's taught you. Don't quit, man. There's been hard times. Like, fuck. I didn't have an easy life growing up. Um, there's been some hard times and I've seen my parents get through a lot and, uh, yeah, just don't quit one foot in front of the other, just like they taught you as a baby, right? Keep going. And if you know, you're going to fall, fall forward. Man, I love that. And I don't think there's any better place to end the interview. Sam, I'm looking forward to see what happens at the worlds with you, my friend. Uh, have a great rest of your weekend and, uh, we'll talk to you soon. For sure, Jeff. Thanks for the opportunity. No problem. Bye for now. Guys, thanks so much for your support of fighters, coaches, and fathers. Subscribe in the circle to the left. In the box to the right, though, if you want to see Sam King's coach, AJ Scales, eight-minute documentary, go ahead and click here.